Okay, good morning, everybody. Oh, it, welcome, welcome to Idea Week. We are so excited to have this event back in person this year. I cannot tell you how great it is. But I also wanted to welcome uh, the people who are joining virtually as well. So uh, we're in for a great week of inspiration and events, and I'm really pleased to be able to kick off our very first session, How Inclusive Prosperity Spurs Entrepreneurship. My name is Kelly Rich. I'm the Interim Vice President of Innovation for the Idea Center. And, um, you know, I am just excited to be able to announce our first speaker. Uh, his name is Philip Gaskin. Philip is the Vice President of Entrepreneurship at the Kaufman Foundation. Uh, Philip Gaskin is uh, Vice President, like I said, <laughs> of Entrepreneurship for the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation, where he is responsible for leading the Kaufman Foundation's effort to build an economy that works for all people by making entrepreneurship an integral component of economic development policies, practices, and programs. As a leader with deep expertise in implementing strategies that change conditions in communities of all types, Philip provides the vision, strategic thinking, and thought leadership to scale and deepen the impact of the Foundation's comprehensive entrepreneurship portfolio which aims to eliminate systemic barriers and enhance economic activity through inclusive entrepreneurship. With deep experience in organizational management in a variety of settings, he is also responsible for the department's strategic planning, talent acquisition, program execution, grants, process, budgeting, operations. Charged with leading the team of more than 30 associates, Philip uses his collective life and work experiences to inspire each associate to achieve extraordinary things, reach their full potential, and impact the lives of those the foundation serves. Uh, before we get started with uh, Philip's uh, presentation, I'd like to let you know if you have questions uh, for Philip, we're going to save those to the end. And you can uh, just join at slido.com if you just uh, type in the code there allow you to submit your questions uh, through the app. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Philip Gaskin. Thank you. Please help join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, hello, we were supposed to do this two years ago and then something happened. <laughs> uh, it's, it's great to be here. Good morning, everyone. And Great to be kicking off Idea Week 2022. So hello to everyone watching online as well. You know, as I say, innovation has been um, at the heart of everything that this region has done and America has done for so long. Um, then the intersection of business and technology and entertainment and those things that we'll be talking about and talking about and seeing this week is really is really um, inspiring. And so it's good to good to see some of you. Um, that I saw when I was see, I guess in 2019, um, and uh, new faces as well. So I look forward to today. Um, so and hopefully you'll hear a few things this week that'll inspire you and inspire entrepreneurs and innovators on how to how to get to where you want to want to go. Last time I was here, I spoke about the import, importance rather of entrepreneurial ecosystems and inclusive ecosystems. And so I wanted to come back today to expand on that a little bit and to talk about inclusive prosperity more, more broadly. You also, for those of you that uh, were, were with me last time, you'll also remember that I started out with a confession. And my confession was that growing up in Los Angeles, I came from a broken home. My dad was a USC fan and my mom was a Notre Dame fan. <laughs> that was fun. Um, um, but uh, actually my mom started out as, a, as an SC fan and changed because when she came here, um, she was area coordinator for Special Olympics for Los Angeles. And she came as a chaperone for all of the, for all of the athletes. And because the International Special Olympics Games was held here on campus, and I believe this was late 80s. And Coach Digger Phelps saw them, stopped what he was doing, gave them a tour of the campus, 
and he could have been doing a lot of other things. And she went back home to LA and told my dad, I'm switching to be a Notre Dame fan. <laughs> and that's how it and that's how it happened. So this um, today I've got a different um, different confession um, and to frame up everything. So I was 34 years old when I heard a word that would, I would say, change, change my life. And so it was at my father's funeral. And afterwards, I was talking with people and family and friends. And a man came up to me and he said, you know, your, your dad was a really good man. You know, he's a really good entrepreneur. And, you know, in my 34 years at that time, that's what I, I had come to know about my dad. So I knew he was a black man with a dark complexion. He grew up in North Carolina during Jim Crow. I knew that he played in the, wanted to play in the Negro League, but he got hurt. And I knew he moved west to Los Angeles because back then the west was seen as this new frontier for black men. And I knew he spent years working maintenance at offices and stores. And I knew that in his late 40s, he opened up one convenience store and then another. But what I never knew is that he was an entrepreneur. I didn't even know what the word meant. And so, so how can that be, right? How can you grow up in America, go to college, and never hear the word entrepreneur until you're 34 years old? And I say, how can that same man, me, go on to become the vice president of entrepreneurship at the Kauffman Foundation, named for one of the great entrepreneurs in history. How does all that happen? Well, those answers to those questions is what I'll share with you today, because understanding why I didn't know the word entrepreneur may be the key to unlocking billions, if not trillions, in investor returns while creating opportunities for millions who just don't have it right now. As I say, the truth is the last great untapped asset class in America is hiding from us in plain sight. So where do, where do we find this asset class and, and um, who are they? So this is where the story comes back to my father. So we, we live near a long street in Los Angeles that crossed through many types of neighborhoods. And so for more, it was more than a boulevard. It was almost like this Berlin Wall because the ex your experiences were vastly different if you live north of the boulevard versus the side of the boulevard that I came from, the south side. If you lived on the north side, you're in a, a much better zip code. And this is where kids of famous people lived or what have you. And they all knew what entrepreneurs, the word entrepreneur was because that word is included in the language of success that they learned at an early age. But I, you know, growing up on the south side, I was just one block away in a different zip code. And that's the edge of where, you know, we were seen as the other people, where the other people live, where the grass wasn't as green, the houses weren't as big, the ambulances didn't get there as fast, the police certainly did, and because we were just one block away. And so I remember my dad and I had this ritual starting when I was in the fifth grade. He picked me up from school and we'd go to a bank. And three or four times a month, we'd go to a bank. Sometimes it was the same bank. And I finally stopped one day and said, Dad, why on earth, why do we go to so many banks? He said, I'll tell you when you get older. Well, it turns out the reason why is because he was trying to get that first loan to open a chain of convenience stores. And so, at these banks, his barrier to entry was quite simple. He lived one zip code away from what they considered worthy, just that, just that one block away. And so he didn't know about redlining. He didn't know that banks in LA were literally drawing lines on a map between those that they would lend to and those that they would not. And so what you see here is one of the different types of zoning maps that was used back in, in the day. And you can see this type of lines that organizations were using to decide who they would lend to, who they would give support to, who they would, consider, who they would be um, considering worthy. So for dad, he was just a little too old, he was a little too dark, and he had good credit. He just didn't have credit experience. And you know, so some, somehow his credit score was always seven points too low or 10 points too low. He was always the other, and it went on for four years. And finally, 
Um, after hearing no dozens of times, he finally heard yes. A black-owned bank saw him as worthy, gave him a loan. And I remember, I do remember that day, because I remember him saying you know, how elated he was. And he said that, you know, someone finally trusted me. And so he went on, he opened a convenience store in South Central LA, and, and then a second one just south of the LA Coliseum. And those investments paid off. I mean, he, he wasn't just a good entrepreneur. He was a good asset to the community because over 20 years, he was giving back. He was employing people from the community. But he never went beyond those two stores because he always said, I don't want to be told that I'm not worthy ever again. And so he stopped because he lived one block away. And you know, it's, it's hard to overstate for people you know, how hard it is day after day, week after week, especially if you're a, an aspiring entrepreneur, to be told that you're not worthy, to be told over and over again that you're not enough. It's hard to describe the anger and the frustration and the urge to act that out, you know, in society, especially if society condemn you if you, if you do that. And so it would be a few more years until I learned what an entrepreneur was. But I, it turns out I learned it just in time to realize that in every city, in every county, in every community, in every country, there are three things that they all have in common. And these three things are central to creating more opportunity for people, advancing equity and inclusion, and closing this growing prosperity gap that we have. So the first, is that in every community, like right here in this part of Indiana, there are risk takers and problem solvers just like my dad. And we call them the builders. We call them the dreamers. We'll be hearing from them this week. And they see opportunities where others see challenges. These are the, the very best of these people are called entrepreneurs. And it's been said that entrepreneurs are people who do more than anyone thinks is possible with less than what anyone thinks is possible. And they have it within themselves to not only create big scalable solutions, but to bring along and inspire others to do the exact same thing. And over the past two years, we've certainly seen this. Entrepreneurs understand that never before have we been more interdependent than right now. Challenges like COVID, climate change, they can't be solved by any one of us. They've got to be solved by all of us. And so from the start of the pandemic, we've seen it. We've seen entrepreneurs across the world hack new solutions to address the need for ventilators, retool their businesses to manufacture medical supplies, and invent new ways for people watching today to stay connected across digital channels. And they serve their communities in the same way they serve their customers, with a force of interdependence right at their core. They understand it's not a zero sum game. This is not about where you have to lose and I have to win. They know we can all win together. And that's why entrepreneurs are so vital to our future. Second, we leave tens of millions of these very special people behind. They never get their chance to realize their ambitions, their dreams, or their ideas that could improve life for everybody. They usually get denied opportunities because they look different, or they sound different, or they come from different places, or have less than others who get the same opportunities. So there are versions of living that one block away in communities across America. Sometimes it's a train track, sometimes it's a zoning line, sometimes it's a bus route. The block could be different. The block may look different. Maybe it's a county, maybe it's a town. Maybe you're just the wrong age. Maybe you're the wrong gender. Maybe you're the wrong color. But the barriers are actually all the same. So a couple of things I'll ask you to try on with me here. So how can it be that so many entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs, people face the same barriers that my dad did 50 years ago? How is that still happening? In 2022, how can it be that black owned businesses are still twice as likely to be rejected for a loan as white businesses? How can it be that women who make up more than half of our population and workforce are 60% less likely to secure funding than men when starting the same type of business? And how can it be that of the $69.1 trillion, trillion with a T, 
in global assets under the four major asset classes, less than 1.3% is invested in firms owned by women and people of color in Black America. So in a competitive global economy, do we really believe that America can afford to waste the energy of even one entrepreneur, let alone half the population? We're not going to be able to sustain like that. So if you're an investor who's doing really well today, the one couple things I'll ask, though, is who's going to buy your products? Who's going to buy the products of those you're investing in? Who's going to buy your products when your children take over? And what we know is that neighbors support neighbors. And if given the opportunity and supporting these underrepresented populations that I'm talking about, it's the best way to create a virtuous cycle of, for communities um, across America, which brings me um, to the reason why we're all here today and the purpose behind the, these innovations that, that we're talking about at Idea Week. The people we need to empower the most, entrepreneurs, to solve problems, to create solutions, as I say, are hiding in plain sight in every community. And if we truly want to create inclusive prosperity, we need to start by empowering these optimists, like my dad was an optimist, to really show what they can do for communities. Again, I, you'll hear me say this, the last great untapped asset class in America. And if we can find ways to support this asset class, I guarantee our country will be more profitable, more equitable, and more competitive. Which brings me to the third thing that every city and community has in common. No matter where you come from, entrepreneurship isn't an art. It's a science. It's a science that can be ignited. Ecosystem building is a science that can be ignited and taught and supported and advanced by an ecosystem that enables everyone to thrive. And so of these three challenges that I've, that I've outlined, it's this third one that really gives us hope because we have seen that when we focus on entrepreneurs, we can close gaps and close gaps in America. So that brings me to Kauffman Foundation. So our passion at Kauffman is to change conditions for entrepreneurs by changing the systems in which they operate. And so we do that by identifying what are the barriers, like I'm talking about today, what are the bar barriers that they face, and tackling root causes rather than just treating the symptoms. And so after working with hundreds, thousands of organizations nationally, we've grouped these ideas into four principles that I'll lead you through right now. Um, that can help entrepreneurs and communities create new jobs, good jobs, and rebuild America that works for everyone, including right here in Indiana. Principle number one, equitable access to opportunity. So entrepreneurship can be an engine for sustainable growth, but not if it remains just too darn hard for people to start and grow a business. And so too many entrepreneurs face this daunting gauntlet of regulations and permits and things. Too many days, too many months just to register a business. And so on entrepreneurs, unlike big corporations, they don't, they don't have the money or the resource to go hire the lawyers or hire the other the resources that they might need and lobbyists to help them navigate through all that. So we can't make this opportunity available until we have all of these um, things addressed. The second, is equitable access to funding. And so we've got we've to close the wealth gap for those who have the talent to become assets in their community. Uh, we've got to close the credit gap for people like my dad, like I mentioned, who are still weighed down by in, invisible walls they, can, they cannot see or touch, but they feel the effects of them, effects of them every day. We've got some really good entrepreneurs who actually weren't helped through the PPP program because a lot of entrepreneurs don't have relationships with banks, longstanding relationships with banks, but so much of the PPP money went through to banks. Entrepreneurs were still hearing your credit score is seven points too low, 11. I, I believe you, I believe in your idea, but I just can't, right? We've gotta, we've gotta change that. Um, as much as we celebrate individual initiative, one thing we've gotta remember that there's no I in the word entrepreneur. Or well, there is an entrepreneurship. That's why I say entrepreneur. But um, and and um, if if we realize that it's a team sport, we're going to have a lot more success. Number three, 
equitable access to knowledge. Far too many courageous entrepreneurs take the risk of starting a business of not knowing where to begin. It's one of the first questions that I get. And which is why our research work at Kaufman is so important to try to come up with the creation of knowledge so that decision makers and entrepreneurs know what to do. So we've got to provide access to networks and mentors and support organizations who have the know-how to help entrepreneurs turn all that know-how into reality and nurture a diverse pool of talent by giving students and teachers at every grade level the real world learning experiences and opportunities they need to succeed. So in Kansas City right now, we're, we're working with 30 school districts across Kansas and Missouri on a real world learning initiative so that in years to come, students will graduate with or even post-graduation po uh, adults have a market value asset, a skill, accreditation stack, so that businesses in the region will see that skill as viable and then employ. So a business to education and an education to business pipeline. That's called our real world learning initiative, which you can see on our website. Number four is it equitable access to support. Maybe you've got a great idea for a business and there's an entrepreneur support school or class across town, but you don't have the money to attend the class or you're working around the clock to feed your family. You just don't have the time or you live too far away. You don't have the transportation to get there. We see this a lot in rural communities. And you put on top of that lack of broadband access. How do you be seen? How do they be heard? If they don't have broadband and they're too far away from a metropolitan place to go to a class. So these are all the barriers to entry that are just desperate, desperate for transformational change. So we've got to work with policymakers to ensure that the risk takers are not locked out of opportunities that can lift their families and their communities up. And so at Kauffman Foundation, we refer to these four principles as America's new business plan, which you can find the plan on our, on our website. So it's a nonpartisan plan that's, create, that's focused on creating new jobs and building prosperity that is diverse equitable and inclusive. And so across the country, we work with individuals and organizations and governments and schools, like I mentioned, to put those principles into practice. And what those organizations are doing is seeing themselves as the vital center of entrepreneurial ecosystem in their community. I'll go back and like I, I said, this isn't, this isn't about it's not zero sum. It's not about taking from one population over to another. It's not about taking from one geography to another. In a way, it's about a different type of IPO. As I say, it's, it's an understanding that America will be stronger if we focus not just on initial public offerings, but on initial people offerings. You know, it's about seeing that America will be more innovative if people like my father have the same opportunity as everyone else. And realizing that in cities and towns across America, that last great untapped asset class is living one block away, is living one county away from the places we have always been looking. They're not, these people are not the other. They're us. They're all of us. And they're the future of this country. And so I say it's long past time that we recognize, like it or not, you know, we're all in this together. It's time for all of us to look that one block over, see that genius that's waiting to be ignited, and the millions of entrepreneurs that just need that chance to show what they can do. It's time for all of us to help create opportunities for them, like the future of our country depends on it. Because you know as well as I do that it does. I thank everyone in this room for what you do on a daily basis. I thank you all out there for what you do on a daily basis. Thank you for having me. It's so exciting to be back. Um, two years was a long time, so good to be here. Thank you.
There we go. All right, it works. Okay, thank you so much. That was uh, was very insightful and, and to me inspiring, even though there are some, some barriers, I, I think you paint a hopeful message about how we can all come together and solve them. Uh, so I'd like to open it up to questions uh, either from the audience or as I mentioned before, you can go to slido.com. Uh, the code is pound IW20221. Um, so I guess there is a question already here we can start with. Uh, the question is, I read that investors tend to fund entrepreneurs in the networks that they are comfortable and familiar with. How can the underrepresented break in? Great point. Um, over 75% of all venture capital goes to four to five geographic centers across the United States. Two point, just about, just over 2% goes to women-led firms, 1% to African-American firms, and less for others. Um, 83% of entrepreneurs do not access traditional forms of financing at the time of starting a business. That's 83% do not. It means you're not getting debt, and we talked about that going to banks, and you can't get venture capital because of this other issue, because of where it all goes. So if you're in the middle of the state or you're in the middle of the country, if you're not one of those five centers, you're gonna have a hard time getting venture capital. So what we try to do is bring to life that there are assets all over. And how do we get more venture capital to expand past geographies and populations that might be most comfortable for, for them? How do we get banks and other institutions to look at more innovative means of financing. So something that we've started at Coffin, we've been testing out, it's called our um, Capital Access Lab. Because our research in 2019 gave us that 83% of entrepreneurs stat. So we said, okay, what can we do as a foundation to try to test something new because the system's not working. So we took a $3 million grant then we put it into a donor advised fund that impact assets. And we ran a request for a proposal across the nation to look at funds led by fund managers who are doing innovative type of financing, revenue-based financing, profit sharing, whatever, to take the weight off the entrepreneur's shoulders at the time of starting the business. And we thought we'd find 20 of them. We found over a hundred, selected six and and those six represent every type of geography, very diverse in geography and, and, and other demographics. And so ourselves and Rockefeller Foundation added another 500,000 as well. So far of that 2.5 .5 million of that money has gone into six funds. Those six funds have taken that and raised an additional $177 million, invested 25 million of that into 40 companies. All of the entrepreneurs that they're investing in represent all the demographics that I'm talking about. This is entrepreneurship for all, but they, they're addressing that 83%. Now, why did we do this? We did this because we wanted to prove out that entrepreneurs that venture capital may miss or um, that banks don't invest in are assets. They're not as risky as you think. They make money. This is a whole asset class out there waiting for you. So that's one of the things that we're, 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 we're looking to, to do. And I would say, if you're not able to get venture capital, if you're running, get, search revenue-based financing, innovative financing models, look for those funds that might be in fund managers that might be in your area or not in your area um, to um, develop a relationship with because we do we do see this this growing um, the other thing is um, if you have a community development financial institution a cdfi in your area feel free to reach out to them We're, we've tested this out in kansas city where we started a covid 19 relief and recovery fund in 2020 and we put eight hundred thousand dollars into a, um, a CDFI called Altcap, A-L-T-C-A-P. They've taken that and 
catalyzed and raised over $7 million, I believe, uh, at, the, at the moment. For sure, it's over $5 million. And did 153 micro loans in eight months with zero default. Zero default during COVID to micro businesses who are seen as overly risky and don't pay bills and all this other stuff. And so we'll be doing another um, $14 million of grants in Kansas City to Altcap and other CDFIs to expand this pool, this loan capitalization pool in Kansas City because according to studies, there's a gap of about $145 million of money that needs to be in the loan pool in the street in Kansas City. So we're doing um, our, um, our part best we can for that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, next question, what is a best practice to improve access to knowledge or support? Ecosystems, so when I was here three years ago, uh, we talked about this when we did it. We had a discussion on the um, our playbook, um, the Kaufman playbook, and how to build an, an effective entrepreneurial ecosystem. The um, and I learned this from the part of my life where I did community organizing that you have to listen seventy percent of the time and talk thirty percent of the time. If you're out of that ratio, you're not listening to what other people need well enough. But I think it, it is it is talking and is finding like people in your in your community that have the, the same interest as, as you do. Um, form a group, join one, talk to a bank, talk to your assembly person, talk to your council person. Um, the power of personal story is real. And if people hear that and understand that, that is the, 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 the first thing to gaining knowledge because look, when we look at the bottom line, an effective entrepreneurial ecosystem is how do you get information and resources from someone who has it to someone who needs it as quickly as possible with the least amount of friction. So talking helps from that perspective. Um, join a 1 million cups. Anyone many in the audience know what a 1 million cups is? Um, 1 million, the Cups, we're in 135 cities across the United States right now. Every Wednesday morning, 9 a.m., two entrepreneurs, one or two entrepreneurs get up, and it's not a pitch session, but they talk to a group of supporters on what they need for their business. And um, that started as an idea 10 years ago. We just started our 10-year anniversary in Kansas City in our cafeteria because we were meeting entrepreneurs all the time saying, can you connect me to someone and I need to be connected? We finally said, why don't we just get all everybody in the same room? Well, now 10 years later, it's 135 cities across the United States. Um, one million cups or one MC. Uh, if there's one near you, please definitely do that. And Kaufman Fast Track, F-A-S-T-T-R-A-C. That's our longest standing program. It's taught affiliates in classroom and also online, self-paced online for free. Um, it's learning entrepreneurship, learning to help start and grow a business. So those are two free resources that we offer. And you can look at our playbook online as well too, kaufman.org forward slash playbook. Um, a lot of good nuggets in there too. Thanks. As, as a follow-up to the discussion about access to funding, mm -hmm. uh, what are the top places uh, minority entrepreneurs specifically can go to get funding right now? Where would you recommend? Well, I would look at look at um, funds like um, Colab, C O L L A B, out of Atlanta, and Jewel Burks Solomon. Um, her fund is doing amazing work. Um, look at Melissa Bradley's eighteen sixty three in Washington D.C. Um, connect with those organizations and in an understanding of uh, or uh, and Kim Folsom with first. Founders First Capital Partners in 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 San Diego, um, happy and happy to do that connecting because they have a wonderful network nationwide, um, and and they're just knowledgeable entrepreneurs, uh, multiple time entrepreneurs that are running funds and doing this investing to to entrepreneurs. Happy to help there. Okay. Again, Thank always this, back to the CDFI. Talk to your local, local, local. Look, look. People are the new economies, and economies are local start local don't think you need to leap over all the all the time and get to something bigger start local start with the conversations local time. 
Okay. No, that's actually a good lead into the next question. No, I'm not even looking. At <laughs> uh, do you have any specific suggestions for this community in particular to improve access for all entrepreneurs? Yeah, I am. Um, I am so excited about what you're doing here. Um, the opportunity, and I said this three years ago, the opportunity, you have industry, community, academia, in a relatively small geographic container. You have all the tools. Unlike any, I think, university town across the nation and area across the nation, you have a unique, unique, unique opportunity because you have urban, you have rural, you have tech, you have ideas, you've got this, you've, you've been, you have all the barriers as well. So it's about understanding that any time that you're convening on a subject, on an idea, always ask your question, who is not in the room that should be? Because it's easy to do that. And, and entrepreneurship can go really fast and entrepreneurs can go really fast. And there's a lot of, especially in tech, and we've seen this in, in tech corridors, it's very, very fast thinking. We gotta go, we gotta change the world. And not only tech, I shouldn't beat up on tech. I mean, just entrepreneurs, I've worked with a lot of them and you go on passion, you go on idea, you go on speed. Sometimes you have blind spots and you forget who also needs to be along the road, along the path with you. And sometimes it's someone that can really give you good information or some that can help you down the line. So I would say for, for here is just making sure, and so that everyone's, you know, I always say, how do you get to the most equitable, everyone have an equitable voice at the table? I'm not saying that's equitable power or anything, that's just equitable voice to be heard to get to the best solutions possible, because without that, um, it's not the team sport that I've been talking about. Is that helpful? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Um, so this uh, this reminds me of the story that you told about your father uh, in your talk. Uh, somebody is asking, doesn't a systematic lack of access discourage people from even considering entrepreneurship? Oh, yeah. And what can we do to encourage people to view themselves as entrepreneurs. It, it sounds like your father, even though he yeah. he was, you know, starting to get discouraged, he viewed himself as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And so how do we how do we encourage that in others? This dogma or whatever it is about it's somehow teaching and teaching kids from the beginning that an idea and failure is perfectly fine. I mean, Ewing, Marion Kaufman, our, our founder, uh, we have something at, at Kaufman called Fail Fest, where at the end of the year, we just get together and talk about how we screwed up. <laughs> and to do that and celebrate that, and say, well, he, Mr. Kaufman used to say, well, then fail, fail fast and start over and do it again, just big deal, just go. But for some reason, and I do think some of this is exacerbated by a, a state that we're in, that and whether it's through social media or what have you, that there's something great, there's something person or something that we just deify. And if we don't become that, we're nothing. And I think too many young folks suffer from that. No, if you start a sole proprietorship or you hire one person and that's your dream, do it, it's fine, you succeeded. I say to entrepreneurs all the time, this is hard, you're brave. For some reason, it gets switched for folks and entrepreneurs thinking, oh, I couldn't make it and what, whatever, stop. The country was built on entrepreneurship. It will keep going on entrepreneurship. And we did a, in our, our research, and you can look at our research reports and briefs on our, on our site, but one of the things that we did a year, maybe a year and a half ago was um, on the entrepreneurship levers, L-E-A-V-E-R-S. And every time I say that, I think a lever to beaver. I just can't <laughs> entrepreneurship levers. But it's over the reasons why entrepreneurs have left and got out, why they didn't get in and why they got out. So I really invite you to, to read that and all of our other research um, wow. um, that, that's up on our, on, our, on, our, on our site for you because 
we're learning what these reasons are. And some of them are social. Some of them, I didn't have the network. Some of the, I, my two friends that I had, had the same viewpoint as I did. I didn't have enough diversity in my friend set. That was a whole bunch of things. And so um, all of those factors go in. And I think your uh, comment about failing forward and being comfortable with failure is extremely yeah. important. We, we embrace that as a value um, yeah. at the Idea Center yeah. and uh, throughout our yeah. entrepreneurship ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. And celebrating it. It's okay. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Nobody's I mean, going to be perfect. You know, parents, our parents, we fell off the bicycle and you know, got training wheels. But okay, get up, try again. It's okay. Yeah, same thing. All right, uh, so next question. How can institutions, uh, financial, government, et cetera, work to build trust within underrepresented communities? Listening, um, I taught the, the PPP example. So it was designed primarily for a distribution network through banks. Most entrepreneurs don't have relationships with banks, GAP. So it's understanding community first, ground up, what are the challenges what what and mayors have so much worth here because it's understanding just getting out in the community it's listening what are the real barriers and we'll be coming out with um it's a um survey of the general population and entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship in the general population survey um that we're partnering with NORC, National Opinion Research Center. And for the next five years, starting this summer, we're going to start getting, we're going to pick up where the census stopped doing. We're going to start getting real, real data now on what are the barriers and challenges in communities. We're going to start with the top 50 uh, metropolitan statistical areas, MSAs, and do a whole bunch of cross tabs around what's really getting in the way of people starting and growing a business. Why are they exiting and all this? These are the type of things that mayors ask us for all the time. And we're gonna have that, that type of information so that mayors can be more intimate for lack of a better word with their communities and understand, okay, now I know exactly, I get it now. And sometimes there's a disconnect. We, um, so that's why I say the, the starting of, as local is just so, so important. You can always feel free to center me back on the question because I'll start going. So <laughs> you can always say, but the question was, Philip. <laughs> um, no, no, that's great. I, I think uh, the element of trust is so important and, and yeah, just yeah. Getting, the, getting that feedback and making that linkage uh, between the yeah. organizations and the entrepreneur. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how can, and this sounds like a very practical question from a budding entrepreneur. But how can you overcome the down payment barrier when you ask for loans if you don't yeah. don't have any assets yeah. and you don't have any credit yeah. or cash on hand? This is what the folks go through. Well, just use your credit card. I just told you I have a, I'm trying to establish credit, so you're asking me to use a credit card. Can't do that. Well, go to friends and family. Well, my perhaps my friends and family don't have the, the wealth strike out after strike out after after strike out um and this is why i go back to if there's a community development financial institution so a number of them are looking at these alternative ways to finance um is seeking one of those out or one of this, these um funds that are doing alternative type of financing because it's the way to get around that um there are uh, some funds in the u.s right now that are doing testing out Character-based lending. I trust you. Trust your pastor. Trust paste. Trust your references. I believe you. And that's a really interesting model uh, because if that if that proves out, that could be transformational for folks. Cut like my dad would have helped him. You know. Um, so that's what I'd say there. Yeah, no, I love that idea of uh, character-based and mm -hmm. not just relying on data right. and statistics right. and, yeah, building yeah. that relationship. Yeah, yeah I would say, even imagine the day. is one of my, my big rocks that I've got there that, that I just want to see the day, and I, I visualize. Imagine one day there's a big spread in a newspaper saying, if not for organizations with 
along with Kaufman, working to change these things, this wouldn't have happened, he's back cast. But imagine the day that you can go into a bank, say you're an entrepreneur, say my dad could have gone into the bank, and they said, I am totally sorry, Mr. Gaskin, but we're just, again, we're not gonna be able to do that loan for you, because of it. But, but wait, but wait, don't run out the door, come back. I've got s another one for you, it's called revenue-based financing, what? Well, you don't have to pay me until you start making revenues because we trust you. Imagine if that's at the point of sale at traditional institutions across the United States. <sighs> See that? When I say about transformational thinking and restructuring, this is, this is you know, we hear it a lot. You hear systems change a lot. It is about changing systems. It is about changing how capital decisions are made and distribution. And again, it's not about taking from one or taking to the other. I've talked about rural communities. I've talked about urban, urban edge, suburban. You know, we're all in this together. Wow, that's, gr that's amazing. And that's uh, transformational ideas like that, that can change the world. That's, that's what Idea Week is all about. Yep. So yeah, that, that is, uh, I'm gonna be thinking about that all week <laughs> long, that's for sure. All right, great. Um, well, I think that's all the questions uh, for this session. So um, again, uh, Philip, I'd like to thank you very, very much uh, for that inspiring talk. And uh, I thought the Q&A session was very engaging. And uh, if you guys would all join me and uh, get round of applause Give for Philip. Give yourself applause.